So Matthew chapter six, follow along with me. We're gonna start in verse 19 and read just a little bit down to verse 21. Matthew 6, 19, we read these words. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your love. I pray, Lord, now that you would bless this service, that you would convict hearts and comfort hearts and, and give us reasons to hope more and more and more and more as we, week, as we meet weekly by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us and the hope that we have because if you bring us to that reality now, Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. So as we've been looking at again and again and again, Jesus is addressing specific areas of our lives, things that we do and don't do, and, and, and takes it right to the, the matter of the heart. What is our heart? What is the condition of our heart? What is our ultimate love? On our, our hierarchy of values, where, where does everything lie? Family, entertainment, God, country, work, where is everything? What is your heart? What is your ultimate love? What do you find the most value in? What are your ultimate goals, your ultimate ambitions? Praise of men, love of the world, love of the things that are lustful, lust, the things that are, as Jesus says, hypocritical. Do we, do we use God? Do we use people? Do we use things to boost our own egos? But it looks on the outside like we're doing a pretty good job with things. What is, what is your heart? What is our heart? He hits on that again and again and again. And not just the, the condition of our heart, but even just our own value. What gives you value? What gives you meaning? What gives you purpose? Every day that your feet hit the floor and you get out of bed, why? Why? If you haven't asked that question before in your life, buckle up, it's coming. It's a hard question to face. Why do we do what we do? And it's interesting, whenever you, whenever you consider this text in full, Jesus is saying something very clear. He says to the religious leaders, he's, he says, you don't, you, you don't actually murder. And, and the, major, you know, the, the religious leaders of the day, they, they didn't. Nobody, they weren't out murdering. They weren't having an affair. They weren't doing any of these things on the outside that was really, really bad. You, know, they weren't, you, weren't, you weren't finding Pharisees drunk in the ditch somewhere. They were astute. They obeyed the law. They followed the Torah all the way down to the letter. You don't actually murder, you don't actually commit adultery, but you really want to. Remember that, remember Jesus says that? You've heard it say do not commit adultery, but I tell you that you, if you harbor lust in your heart, then you're an idolater at heart. And conversely, he says you actually do give and you actually do fast and you actually do pray but whenever you do again your heart is wrong you're doing it because you want people to look at you and applaud you're doing it because you want people to look at you and admire there really is somebody right there man there he is there she is I want to we ought to be like them we ought to be like her and that makes you feel good that's your that's your personal wealth that's your personal income and it's a very strong temptation to not seek after the praise of men And so Jesus is lovingly guiding us towards what is eternal and what is good and what is trustworthy and he's guiding us away from what is not because personal preservation and affirmation and love are not bad things or sinful things to pursue. The sin comes in when we start looking for those things in the wrong places and doing sinful things to get something from somebody, something like praise or admiration. And so to this morning, we're gonna talk about wealth. And as we will see, it's the obsession with wealth that is not only idolatrous, this I, I want to be well off, I want money more than anything else, that becomes idolatry. That's putting something, something of value above God. And that's what idolatry is. And not only is it idolatry, but it's just a bad investment. It's not a good payoff. I was walking with my daughter during the snow 
and there's a cemetery right by our house. You can't miss it. I mean, if you walk down the sidewalk, you're going to eventually hit the cemetery. And I was walking with this little girl who's just begun life, and I was looking at all these stones, 1880 to 1934, 1920 to 1997, dead, 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 dead. Thousands of people dead. And that's why it's a bad in investment, because even if you get everything that you want, <laughs> in the end, you end up dead. Ecclesiastes 2, if you've never read the book of Ecclesiastes, go home and read it. Very, very realistic take on uh, life on earth. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 18 and 19 say this, Thus I, I have hated all the fruit of my labor, for which I have labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a man of simple-minded folly. <laughs> Yet he will have power over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored and for which I have acted wisely under the sun. And this too is vanity. Next time you get in an argument with somebody, tell them that they're somebody of simple-minded folly. It's just a good diss. Don't do that. Don't do that. Obsession with wealth. I need to have it. I must have it. Idolatry and just a bad investment. It doesn't pay out in the end. And so to obsess over wealth is sin, but to have it or to earn it or to even save it up is in and of itself is not sin. There's nothing sinful about savings. Proverbs 6.6 6 says, Look at the ant, you sluggard, and consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief or any ruler or any officer, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Even the ant knows to plan ahead. It's a wise thing to do. Paul says very strictly, 1 Timothy 5.8, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for the members of his own household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. In Acts chapter 5, very famous story, Ananias and Sapphira have a plot of land. They sell it to give the money to the church, and they lie. They say, here's all of the money that we have, and they actually held some back, and that was the problem. That was the sin. And you know the story, they were struck dead on the spot, not because they didn't give all of their money, but because they told a lie. But that's not the point of what's happening here. But whenever they give the money, Peter says to them, when the property was, before it was sold, wasn't it yours? And then even once you had sold it, was it not in your possession? Was it not in, in your power? It, it, was, it was your own. So having stuff, even having some extra stuff in and of itself is not the problem here. Again, the problem is the problem of the heart. The Ten Commandments alone, they say, it says in the Ten Commandments, do not envy and do not steal, which assumes that you have something that can be envied and can be stolen. The Bible does not teach that possessions or even savings are evil or sinful, but what is our relationship to those savings? What is our relationship to our wealth? Jesus does not say here, do not store up. What he says is do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Material things are neutral. The sin is this, this grabbing, rapacious greed, this need to have it, and going to any lengths to get it and thinking that when you when you get something that wealth trusting that that wealth is better than God himself better than family better than anything I'm safe as long as I have this and that is idolatry and then the danger becomes that then wealth can very easily become something that serves us we can use wealth to do amazing things and it actually becomes something that we serve and then it becomes our master verse 24 Jesus says no one can serve two Masters, so he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And how easy is it for wealth to be this thing that's good and beneficial and useful, great utility for the people around you, but it can very easily master you. And Jesus says it's idolatry and it's a bad investment. And he's guiding us to something better. If you want self preservation, if you really want a, pay, a payday in the end, it's not in wealth, it's not in money, it's in Jesus Himself. Even if you get money, even if you're successful in your finances, you'll end up becoming identified with worry because you treasure wealth above all else. And if you don't have it, if you don't have wealth, you'll be absolutely consumed with the idea of getting it. And if you do have it, you're constantly worried about maintaining it. 
Because if you lose it, you don't just lose security. You don't just lose the sense of safety that wealth provides, but you actually, if, if, it's, if it's your main goal, if it's your main ambition, if it's your main drive, if it's, if it's your sum and bonum, if, you're, if it's the best of the best for you, then if you lose it, you don't just lose security, you lose yourself. You lose your sense of value. You lose your own sense of, your sense of worth. You may lose your standing in community. You may, you may have to cancel your country club subscription. You know, you lose the ability to go places. You lose maybe your good name or maybe even your influence in place at the table. It's a bad investment. In Luke chapter 12, I, you know, if, if you've got, if you're taking notes, write down Luke chapter 12 because it's a, it's a, it's a really good uh, description of, of this. It's, it's, it's Jesus' same teaching and he just says, a, a, he says some real poignant things. He, he tells a story in, in Luke, in Luke 12, uh, the parable of the rich fool. And he, he paints this picture of, of a guy who's very successful and he's so successful in agriculture that he doesn't have enough barns to hold his grain, to hold his crop. And so he starts thinking to himself, what am I gonna do since I don't have any more room? Well, this is what I'll do. I'll just build bigger barns. And it's like, well, fair enough. Two plus two is still four. That works just fine. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But this is where the man makes a mistake. This is where he's off. Luke 12, 19, he says this, he says, I'll build bigger barns and then I will say to my soul, listen to this. He says, I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for you for many years to come. So take your ease, eat and drink and be merry. Hear the, like the rejoicing there, I've made it. I've worked hard, I got up early. I showered, I shaved, I put on my shoes, I sat in traffic day after day after day, and now I've made it. It's paid off. All of my hard work has finally paid off. Verse 20, but then God said to him, you fool, for this very night your soul is now required of you, and now who will own the property that you have prepared? That's Ecclesiastes 2, 18 and 19. That's all of the tombstones I was walking by with my daughter one after the other after the other that's guaranteed where we're all going to end up promise that's where we're all going to end up what is a good investment the problem is the soul you are okay you are secure you can take your rest because you have a bank account you have security that's specifically what's being addressed here we rejoice because we think, well, we've, if we have enough money, then we have safety. And we want safety. And safety is a good thing to want. But wealth is not the ultimate place to find it. Remember Luke chapter 10. The disciples go off to do missions work. And the demons are even subject to them in the name of Jesus. And they come back rejoicing. They come back with the report Master, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus says to them, do not rejoice. Don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. There's some real security right there. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Life is more, Jesus is going to talk about this in a few more verses. Life is more than food. It's more than clothing. It's more than safety here because life is about more than this existence here on earth. There's more to us than right here and right now. And that's why wealth can be dangerous and even idolatrous because we can forget, remember what we talked about last week, we can forget that we're diminishing. We can forget that we're slowly passing away even if we're well fed and energized and in good health. We're still decreasing. And wealth is a really easy way to forget that we're homesick and a really easy way to forget that we're not home at all. Proverbs 30 verse 8 says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me the food that is, necess- that is necessary for me, lest I be full and then deny you and say, who is Yahweh? You know, it's, it's true, isn't it? Well-fed, indoor plumbing, clean water, roof over your head, the whole, the whole thing. A job that pays you a salary every year. It's easy to forget. When you get comfortable, it's easy to forget. It's easy to drift. And it's easy to start forgetting, namely, about God himself. That every breath you take, every time your heart beats, that you have no control over, he's doing that. He's keeping you alive. He's the one who gets the praise. You might work hard and earn your money, and that's great. That's great. But we forget God. 
Just put your finger on your pulse. He's doing that. He's doing that. It's easy for us to forget. Jesus says more about money than he does about sex or heaven or hell because this is a serious problem for us. Everything here will fail. Everything that we work hard for, everything that we strive so hard for, the getting up, the, sha- the shaving, the showering, the driving traffic, and we, th- and we build up this wall of wealth and we think this is, this is it. This is it. Awesome. Soul, take your rest. Eat, drink, and be merry. But that wall of wealth can be destroyed in an instant and it's definitely being destroyed slowly by moth or by rust or by thieves. You know, one of the wealthiest men in human history and one of the most prolific drug lords of all time was Pablo Escobar. And after Pablo Escobar died, not taking a cent with him, by the way, his brother was being interviewed and his brother revealed that two things that I thought like blew my mind blew my mind. His brother revealed to the people interviewing him that Pablo Escobar and his crew just sort of wrote off annually 10% of his income because it would be, he was, he was so rich, he couldn't use the bank. So he would take piles and piles and piles of cash and either bury it or leave it in these storehouses. And so he would write off 10% of his income every single year because his income, his cash money would be eaten by rats or it would fall prey to some sort of flood or earthquake or being stolen because it was just buried in the ground. 10% of Pablo Escobar's income eaten by rats, literally. You know what 10% of his income was annually? It was $2.1 billion eaten by rats. The other thing that he said that I was like, good night, you know, I had to do like the red fox, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, for those of you who know, you know. He spent, Pablo Escobar, so you have cash, right? What do you do? You wrap it up in a rubber band, you throw it in a duffel bag or something else. Pablo Escobar spent $2,500 a month on rubber bands. That's $30,000 a year to wrap up cash that he would bury in the ground and it would mold or he'd throw it into a a, a warehouse somewhere and it would get eaten by rats. $2.1 billion a year. Big, big wall of security, big wall of wealth. Moth, rust, thieves, rats, mold. That's really what you're putting your faith in. We need something more than that. We need something more dependable. We need someone better. We're told, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Moth, moth, rust, rats, thieves, boom, gone. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. First question, how? Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How? First, faith in Jesus. Get saved. Put your faith in the resurrected Christ. Today is the day of salvation. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And to believe is to embrace. To see God in the flesh, to see him dying for your sins on the cross and say, yes, please, I bring nothing to the table. My billions are not worth it. My, my, my health, my wealth, my prosperity, nothing. I cannot earn it. Just in faith, by grace, come to Jesus, confess him as Lord and Savior, and be saved. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. John 1, 12 says that Jesus came. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God. That means that you get his house. That means that you get his wealth. That means that you're in his inheritance. I don't have much, but everything that I have is Ellis because she's my child. Anyone that believes in him, believes in his name, anyone who receives him, he gave the right to become children of God. And this whole new reality, this being a child of the living God changes our hearts and our values. And we live now with eternity in mind, preferring God's ways over our own. And one of the things that he tells us to do is to be generous with our money and to give it away. Again, Luke chapter 12, Jesus says this, give to the charity. He says, sell all all you have and give to the charity. Make money belts for yourselves that don't wear out. An unfailing treasure that is in heaven. Now the Bible does speak about, so this this unfailing treasure in heaven, this reward, the, the Bible says a lot about rewards. In Matthew 10, Jesus says, if anybody gives one of these disciples even so much as a cup of cold water, he surely will not lose his reward. The Bible speaks about 
re- rewards in, at the end of time that are, that are identified as, as crowns. There's at least five that are, that are spoken to or spoken of specifically. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul talks about receiving the crown of righteousness. In 1 Corinthians 9, he talks about the crown that is imperishable. 1 Thessalonians 2.19, the crown of rejoicing. 1 Peter chapter 5, the crown of of glory. And Revelation chapter 2 talks about the crown of life. By the way, I know that I speak quickly. If anybody wants these verses in print, I've got my notes right here. Come and talk to me. I will give you a copy. I'll email you a copy. These are verses that are good to have in the old noggin. The Bible talks about actual reward at the end of time. But what's absolutely true and ultimately true is that Jesus Christ himself, God in human flesh, is our reward. A, a relationship with him, an intimate relationship with him. Going over to his house, so to speak, and him knowing you and welcoming you in and taking your coat, an intimate love relationship with the God who holds the sun up and the earth at spin. That God, knowing him intimately, knowing him in a loving, embracing relationship, that is a reward. That is eternal life. John 17, 3, Jesus says in the high priestly prayer, Jesus praying to Father God says, this is eternal life, that they, his disciples, and us today, anybody who's a believer, anybody who Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that they would know you. This is eternal life, that they would know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. To know him, to be in communion with him is eternal life. Colossians 2 says, may their hearts be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Knowing the Lord more and more and more and more and more is in and of itself a tremendous treasure and a privilege that he offers us when he sent his son to die for our sins. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, Now I know in part, but then I will know in full, even as I have been fully known. To know God is a treasure. And we will know him more in the next life than we will in this life, but we will never know his end. His depths are beyond anything that anybody can ever fathom, ever. He is our very life. He is our life. 1 John 5, 11 says, this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. You got, you got 2.1 million in the bank being eaten by rats and that's just like your leftovers. You do not have life. You run a six minute mile, you do not have life. Healthy, wealthy, pros- pro- a lot of prosperity, O oh soul, take your rest. No, O oh soul, do not, because you do not have life. He who has the Son has life. They who do not have the Son do not have life. Jesus is our life. First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Jesus is our righteousness. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. The absolute standard of perfection that is God's requirement to enter into his heaven he gives to you as a gift, by grace, through faith, in his name. Every moment that Jesus was breathing, he had you in mind, and he never sinned once in word, thought, or deed, and that perfect legal standard is applied to you. It's given to you. His righteousness is given to you as a gift. He is our righteousness, he is our life, he is our family. Romans 8, 16 says, the spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and we are heirs of God, we are co-heirs with Christ. And he is our greatest pleasure. Even here, even now, our greatest pleasure. Psalm 16 says, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The things, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Make known to me the path of life. And in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Jesus Christ is also our home. We're not home. We're homesick. And wealth, it's a gift. 
Health is a gift, family is a gift, success in business, it's a gift, children are a gift, marriage is a gift, it's beautiful, and we can use those things to serve God, but they are not our ultimate sustainer. It was ironic, I don't have time to talk about it any more than I already have, but it was ironic walking with my baby girl looking at tombstones and thinking, man, try as I may, Ella's on her way there. Try as I may, I'm on my way there. What do I have? Jesus. Friends, Jesus. He's made himself available to you. He is our home. He is our greatest pleasure. Psalms 8410. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. And maybe maybe my favorite of all the Psalms, one last Bible verse, Psalms 4, 7, Psalms chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. You have given me more joy than they have when their grain and wine abound. Right? Luke 12. I'm going to build bigger barns. You've given me more joy than they have when their grain and their wine abound. And in peace, I will both lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety, security, promise, guarantee, life eternal. Sweet, I have time. I think that it's okay to consider that this, this text is specifically about wealth. But, but notice, so in, in verse 21, Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I think that it's safe, and I don't think that it's eisegesis for you, you nerds out there like me. I don't think that it's reading into the text to say that Wealth is not the only thing that we can treasure up. Wealth is not the only thing that we can put our utmost value and worth into. Because there is, there is your heart also. Where your treasure is, there is your heart, your heart also. And, and treasure, it's very interesting. The, the Greek word for treasure is actually the word where we get our English word, theosaurus, which is a treasury of, of words. The basic idea is to treasure something up somewhere. And I must confess that as, as sweet and as alluring as, as money is, it's, it, it has, in, in my personal life, it's never been my ultimate goal. I actually want to show you a picture because the, this is the, the weirdness of the human heart and specifically the, the weirdness of my heart. And I'm going to have to explain this, but I have a picture that I want to show you of my ultimate treasure. This is my ultimate treasure. That's me hitchhiking in 2012. I'm on my way to Boulder, Colorado. I'm broke. I'm ugly. I'm wearing a pair of female sunglasses that I found at a gas station or something. And I'm wearing borrowed clothes. I flew to Colorado in 2012 just to hitchhike and climb mountains. Because now here's, here's, the, here's the idolatry part. This is very silly, but I didn't want money. I've never wanted money. I've never want, but what I wanted was freedom. I wanted experience. I wanted to have an Instagram scroll thing, an Instagram handle when people, people would look at it and be like, man, I want to live that guy's life. He's in Switzerland. He's in Germany. He's in Bruges. He's drinking wine under the Eiffel Tower. He's hitchhiking in middle America. He's climbing 14,000 foot peaks. Sick. Now all of that takes a little bit of money, but not really. This was what I wanted. And, and you know what? I got it, and I got, you know, you end up just smelling bad, and I did get a ride. Can you believe it, though? Somebody actually, somebody actually picked us up on my way to Boulder, Colorado. We, we can put that down. I'm not going to keep showing pictures of my life, I promise. I just, I saw that, and I was like, you know what? That, that's my, that is my, that's my goal. That was what I wanted. I remember very specifically, I remember the first time that I finally like broke away, you know, I was like, you know, for you guys who know Jack Kerouac or Chris McCandless or these Neil Cassidy and Allen Ginsberg and all these, these poets and these thinkers and philosophers who wanted to burn their social security guard and start a rucksack revolution in the woods and break away from anything that you could plug in and just live in the woods and eat berries and poop in the woods and that whole thing, you know, just get away from society and live a life of adventure and unpredictability and youth and vigor and just attack it man where are we going I don't know but we're on the way like I was into that and I remember the first time that I got out of Portland I was I I took a U-Haul from here to California and I got dropped off in Joshua Tree and I just got left there in the middle of the desert and I was hitchhiking out of Joshua Tree and I remember thinking I'm here soul you can be at rest 
Soul, take your ease. Soul, eat, drink, and be merry. You're broke, but go to a food kitchen. Like, you're, do it. And the voice of the Lord came to me in that moment and said, what, what are you doing? You abandoned your church family. You left Door of Hope for this. You left your actual family to seek some sort of selfish ambition. You know that your mother is worried sick about you right now? And you're out here just shun, you know, just running around. And I'm not saying there's anything you know, wrong with this necessarily, but I, I left my church community. For me, leaving Portland was wrong and the Lord corrected me. And I was so miserable out there hitchhiking that I came back home of my own volition. It took a long time, but there was nothing there. And so whether it's wealth or whether it's the, the I, would, I, would, I would probably summarize that picture as just like the freedom of youth. You can do whatever you want. We chase things. We put something on the vision board. And in and of itself, it's fine. But me holding a Boulder, Colorado sign was not just like some trip for me. It was the reason why I was born. And if I didn't get that story, if I didn't get that life, then I was wasting my life. And that was a lie. That was false. So I envied experience. I sought after trips and adventure and everything else. It was my God. It was my, it, that was my idol. So in conclusion, I'll start landing this. Some, some may say, well, who, who is this Jesus? Who is he and why should I trust him? And what has he ever done to prove that he's worth my faith? And I would say, well, you, you, start, you start to feel very comfortable trusting Jesus when you see who he is, and he is God, you, begin, you get very comfortable trusting him when you see who he is and you see what he treasures. When you see who he is and you see what he loves, you will trust him. Treasure is a thing that we love the absolute most, something that you would die to have. You would die to get it. And Jesus is the only treasure that died to have you. We, we die for whatever it is that we absolutely love. And they've made a lot of really great movies about men and women who have sacrificed themselves for their one great love. But Jesus died for us because we are his love. We are his treasure. We're told in Hebrews that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And that joy is big. There's a lot there, but it includes you and me, sinful, twisted-hearted people, saved and redeemed and welcomed into his home. He died for that. As he was dying, he cried out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When you see who Jesus is and you see what he has done, you see what he treasures, then trusting him starts to make a whole lot of sense. I hate to use this word, but it looks like a good investment. But that's what it is. It might cost you everything in this life, but he promises you in eternity. He promises you a home forever. And even now, he is sustaining us. Our heartbeat, our lungs, the blood flow in our body, he's sustaining the universe itself. Hebrews 1.3 says so. And when you know this and you see him on the cross there to save your life, that generosity and that hope that you have of his kingdom will cause us to become a more generous people. His kingdom is one that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. The exact, exact opposite of destroyed by moth and rust and thieves. I'll close with this. Luke 12, one of my favorite Bible verses. Luke 12, verse 32 through 34. Jesus teaching the same thing. He says, do not fear little flock for your, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So sell your possessions. You're getting the kingdom. Sell your possessions as charity. Make for yourselves money belts that do not wear out and an unfailing, for an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes in and where moth does not destroy for where your treasure, treasure is, your heart will be there also. Notice Jesus says, fear not, because we tend to fear. Do we not? We tend to fear. Jesus says, fear not. We think that if we give, we won't have enough for ourselves. It doesn't mean that we need to sell absolutely everything. 
This is very, this is, this is personal. This is where you have to check your heart and, and, and test yourself. But we can give wisely and not fear. Jesus tells us to fear not. He calls us flock, fear not little flock because he is the shepherd. He says your father because he is a father. He says kingdom because God is a king. Jesus is king, Jesus. He's putting us at ease. He's putting our fear at ease. He's a good shepherd, he's a good king, he is a good father and we are so fearful and he knows that and he's telling us that the best and most trustworthy treasure that there is, is himself. God is our treasure, God has made himself available to us and he wants us to give to the things that he cares about and to trust him. Do you trust him? If you don't, you do not know him, not enough. And yeah, I, you know what, personally, yeah, I, I want you to give to Skate Church. I want you to give to Door of Hope. These places don't exist on, on their own. We, we, we need the finances to pay for the bills. But what I'm, what I'm where, my, where my heart is, is with your heart. I want you to know this Jesus. The natural ramification of knowing Jesus will be a generous spirit. A God who went to the cross for you so that you could live secure and have safety forever. He did that because he's that good and he loves you that much. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads with me. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the security that we have in you. Thank you for the promise that we have in you. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. And Jesus, I pray that anything that gets in the way from if anybody here really getting to know you, really getting, really getting honest with the fact that we're on this little, this little ball of rock spinning around a big ball of fire in outer space. This is so big and beyond us and temporary. Lord, I pray that you would move in people's heart by the power of your spirit to bring people into your home. We have no security here. We have no reason for hope or for trust. We're a speck on a speck on a speck for a small amount of time, but you love us. We are nothing without you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would draw people to yourself and there would be salvation in this house this morning. And that people would understand the balance, that money is not wrong, travel is not wrong, experience is not wrong, but that it's a, it's a, it's a wrong God. There are wrong things to hope in. There is salvation in no other name under heaven by which men and women must be saved in the name of Jesus. And Jesus, you have proven that you are overqualified for death because you died and then you rose again. And you offer that immortality to us. Death is swallowed up in victory. Thank you, King Jesus. We love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.